your journey. I know not what you seek in this faraway land. But I pray for your safety. Please take these. Consider this thanks for keeping me sane. My name is Lucatil. I beg of you, remember my name, for I may not myself. And thus ends the story of Lucatil of Mira. Now this is the quote-unquote good ending we get for Lucatil. If you don't meet all the conditions for her to appear at Aldia's Keep, she presumably goes hollow and disappears. But thanks to our efforts in helping her survive the various bosses and repeatedly talking to her, we have helped keep her sane and help her remain human. The real tragedy here is that her journey ends just short of someone she was dearly searching for. Her brother, Aslatil of Mira. Lucatil's brother is now a vengeful red phantom. So in some ways, it's probably good that Lucatil never did meet her brother. But at the same time, it is sad knowing that she was so close to finding one that she truly loved. Lucatil's sword, the Mira Greatsword, reads, Great sword issued to the proud knights of the Mira's official order. This one was wielded by Lucatil. This great sword demands advanced skill in a rare and unique sword technique. A tiny message is inscribed in the blade, a promise to someone special. And this is most likely Lucatil's brother. We learn even more in some of her armor descriptions, namely Lucatil's vest. Vest worn by knights while on travel belong to Lucatil of Mira. Only those who have distinguished themselves on the battlefield were admitted into the elite ranks of Mira's official order of knights. It is common to hear of a peasant's dream of striving for knighthood as an escape from hardship, but who would think it ever possible? Well, it was possible, Lucatil, and thanks to your strength of will and your own humanity, you have prolonged your existence and have fought against the curse of the undead. And we will honor our promise. We will remember your name, Lucatil. Come of it. Just leave me alone, please. Leave this place and leave me be, as I'd not see any harm befall you. Please, just leave me alone. The man we talk to, who is locked behind a magical barrier, is known as Royal Sorcerer Navlan. Navlan has a unique story in that depending on whether you talk to him in a hollowed form or in a human form, his personality will change. When you talk to him in human form, he's a meek person who only wants to hide away from the world. And for good reason, because he fears his darker half. And this half of Navlan appears when you talk to him in his hollow form. Navlan's hood, the Chaos Hood, reads, Hood worn by a Chaos Sorcerer. The man claims to have sealed himself away, but who's ever heard of sentient magic? It is no doubt difficult to judge the veracity of the man's words, but this hood certainly seems 
to possess an unusual power. And the reason he locked himself away is because the darker half of Navlon seeks to kill those who he either desires something from or just for his own amusement. It is possible to engage in a storyline where he sends you off to kill several NPCs and bring back a trophy to show your victory. What I do like about this questline is it is possible to just obtain these items through other means, that way you don't actually have to kill the NPCs, because I've never really liked killing NPCs in Dark Souls, unless I know they're just really evil, evil people. The other upside to completing Navlon's story is that you gain access to some of the most powerful spells and pyromancies in the game, as well as some cool clothing pieces for various sorcerers. He does have a really interesting story, but I won't be going too much in depth with him since I'm not playing as a pyromancer or sorcerer this playthrough and I don't really want to kill any friendly NPCs. So for now, we'll keep him locked away from the world, as this is what his better half wishes us to do.
This keep we're now exploring belonged to a man known as Lord Aldia, who was brother to King Vendrick. Unlike his brother, Aldia didn't really desire the throne of power and instead sought power through other means, namely through forbidden knowledge and secrets with experimentation and magic. And within the walls of this keep, many great discoveries and unspeakable atrocities were committed in the name of Lord Aldia. The Aldia Hammer reads, Hammer used by Aldian acolytes, not used as a weapon, but as an instrument to dissect the bodies of the victims of their experimentation. They say that Lord Aldia was the king's elder brother and helped found Drang Lake, but he later lost interest in the land's fortunes. What I think is interesting of note here is that we would assume by default that Vendrick was the elder brother because he was the king, so, because usually in monarchies, that's how it works with siblings, is the elder son will take the throne. But it is, in fact, Aldia who's the elder. And as I, I mentioned, he has no desire for the throne. Although he did help found the kingdom, he sought his interests through other means. Mask worn by the acolytes of Aldia. Several of the greatest minds converged in Aldia to weave strange new rituals. But rumors suggest that during the course of their work, their thoughts were not their own. The nebulous face of the mask is designed to deflect the ire of the ritual sacrifice. Now this is where things get really creepy and mysterious, and this shows that there's a whole lot more to Aldia's character than we first imagined. And this is evident by all the caged monsters and corpses we find all throughout. And what is probably the most fascinating is in the one room we find corpses of the giants. So this shows that Lord Aldia experimented on the giants during the War of the Giants in Drang Lake. And Aldia had a great obsession with the ancient dragons, and possibly tried to emulate their power, as we find many creatures called Enhanced Undead in other parts of the world, who were undead fused with the, the power of dragons, creating these abominations, really. Even though Aldia did some really terrible things to further his own agenda, there is an element of tragedy to his story as well. The Aldia Key reads, Key used in the mansion of Aldia. King Vendrick condemned his own elder brother to the mansion. They both sought the truth, but through different means, and their fervor meant the eventual withering of their family ties. So both brothers fought to bring an end to the curse of the undead, but they went about it completely different ways, even though Aldia no longer resides within this mansion, this does not mean he is completely gone from the land of Drang Lake. We'll find out later on what has happened to Lord Aldia, and how he is still integral to the ultimate destiny of this kingdom and the world.
My favorite thing about the Guardian Dragon boss is the arena you fight this boss in. I love the the birdcage aspect this gives to the boss fight and how the dragon will crawl up on various parts of this great cage trying to attack you. But what I love even more about this boss is this amazing view we get after the fight. Oh my gosh, this has to be one of my favorite vistas in the entire Soul series, if not my favorite. I just It just takes my breath away every single time looking at these this fantastic cliff and all these towering rocks and the lush forests and distant mountains and clouds. It's, it's just so brilliant. And I know it's not one of the areas you can actually visit in the game, but the view alone after that boss fight is totally worth it. And it's just incredible, at least in my opinion. I think it's an absolutely incredible part of the game. But what's possibly even more incredible is the area of the game this leads to. Soul of the dragon that guards the path to the shrine. Do the dragons watch over the land of their own will, or are they in the grip of one of Aldia's spells? And notice how it said dragons, plural. And that's because the next area we're going to traverse through is the magnificent Dragon Airy. Resist. The dragon welcomes you. 